All right, so let's talk about a guy who pretty much changed chemistry forever, but whose own brilliant theory had this one major flaw that held things back for decades. And on top of all that, this scientific giant was trying to solve a very personal and kind of weird mystery his entire life. And no, that's not the start of some weird joke. That was the actual honest-to-goodness final request of the great John Dalton. So why? Well, to get to the bottom of it, we've got to jump back to 1794. That's when he published the first ever scientific paper about a condition that both he and his brother had to live with. You see, Dalton figured out that the way he saw the world was just different from how most people saw it. He was the very first person to scientifically describe what we now call colorblindness. I mean, his work was so foundational that for a while there, people just called the condition Daltonism. That's how big a deal it was. Now, being the scientist that he was, Dalton couldn't just leave it at that. He needed a reason, a rational explanation. His big idea? He thought that the jelly-like stuff inside his eyeball, it's called the vitreous humor, he figured it must have a blue tint. That it was acting like a built-in filter, you know, blocking out certain colors. It makes sense, right? A totally logical, mechanical explanation, which was very much his style. And this is where the scientific process really kicks in. The day after he died, his doctor did exactly what he asked. And the result? The fluid in his eyes was perfectly clear. No blue tint, nothing. Dalton's big theory, the one he held on to his whole life, was wrong. The mystery of his vision was completely unsolved. So they preserved his eyes, which ended up waiting for a kind of science he could never have dreamed of. But yeah, let's put a pin in that story for just a minute. Okay, so while Dalton was busy puzzling over his own eyes, the rest of the scientific world was obsessed with an even bigger puzzle. What is stuff made of? What is the fundamental nature of matter? At this time, chemistry was going through this huge transformation, moving away from the you know, mystical art of alchemy and becoming a real science based on measurement. And to really appreciate Dalton's breakthrough, you have to look at the clues that were already on the table. Scientists were finally starting to measure things really, really accurately. And out of all the old, confusing theories, some clear patterns were starting to show up. First up, you had the brilliant French chemist Antoine Lavoisier. He showed that when you burn something, the matter doesn't just vanish into thin air. If you could capture all the smoke and ash, the total weight would be the same as the original stuff. The big takeaway was simple but profound. Matter is conserved. It doesn't get created or destroyed. Okay, so that was clue number one. Then came clue number two from Joseph Proust. He figured out that a compound, let's say water, always has the exact same proportion of hydrogen and oxygen by mass. It doesn't matter if you scoop it out of a river or cook it up in a lab, the ratio is always the same. So elements combine in these fixed predictable ways. These were the puzzle pieces just lying there, waiting for someone to put them together. And this is where John Dalton comes back in. He's the guy who looked at all these separate clues and saw how they all fit together. He had this this aha moment, a truly revolutionary idea that could explain everything. His thinking went something like this. The only way you could get these fixed ratios is if all matter is made up of tiny individual building blocks, little fundamental particles. He reached way back to the ancient Greeks and pulled out their word atomos, which literally means uncuttable. And he used that to describe these particles. He basically just did these thought experiments, imagining how they must be combining. And this right here, this is the heart of his entire theory boiled down to five simple points. It's so elegant and powerful. It explained all the data they had at the time. This was it, the first truly scientific theory of the atom. It literally became the foundation for all of modern chemistry. But, and this is a big but, there was a problem baked right into it. See, Dalton made an assumption that honestly seemed totally logical at the time. He called it the rule of greatest simplicity. He just figured, hey, nature is simple. If two elements combine, they probably do it in the simplest way possible, right? One to one. So when he thought about water, he assumed it was just one hydrogen atom and one oxygen atom, HO, not H2O, like we know today. And that one little mistake, it threw off all his calculations and caused a ton of confusion in chemistry that lasted for decades. And this really gets to the heart of the paradox of John Dalton. The man was an absolute genius. His theory was a game changer. But at the same time, his own stubbornness and some of his core beliefs 
actually ended up holding back the very science he had just revolutionized. This is going to sound kind of crazy, but Dalton, the father of the modern atom, actually held on to this ancient, totally wrong idea about matter. He sided with Aristotle, believing that atoms were all packed together, touching each other with no empty space in between. This meant he completely rejected the ideas of people like Avogadro, who was arguing correctly, it turns out, that matter is mostly empty space, with tiny particles whizzing around. And his resistance to new ideas wasn't a one-off thing. When another chemist, Brazilius, came up with the modern system of chemical symbols we all use today, you know, H for hydrogen, O for oxygen, Dalton absolutely despised it. He thought his own system, which used little circles and patterns, was way better, and that these newfangled letters just made things confusing. So what's the big deal? Well, the consequence was huge. Because Dalton was such a rock star in the scientific community, his mistakes carried a lot of weight. His incorrect belief that water was HO and his rejection of empty space between atoms, it basically sent the whole field of chemistry on a 50-year detour. The science was just stuck, kind of spinning its wheels, waiting for the next generation of scientists to finally fix the great man's errors. Okay, but remember that other story, the one we put a pin in? Let's circle all the way back to that other puzzle, the mystery of John Dalton's eyes, which had been sitting in a jar, preserved for more than a century and a half. All right, let's fast forward way forward. The year is 1995. 151 years have passed since Dalton died. And in what has to be one of the most perfect twists in the history of science, the very field that Dalton himself created ended up providing the tools to solve his personal mystery. Using our modern understanding of atoms and molecules, his legacy, scientists were able to take a tiny piece of his preserved eye tissue and extract his DNA. And the DNA? Well, it told the real story. Dalton's theory about his eyes was completely wrong. There was no blue fluid filtering the light. The real reason was in his genes. He was missing the gene for the photoreceptor that detects green light in his retina. The final diagnosis? Deuteranopia, a classic form of red-green colorblindness. After 150 years, the mystery was finally solved, not with a guess, but with the very chemistry he pioneered. So Dalton's whole story really makes you think, doesn't it? Here's a guy who was a total genius who got the big picture, Adams, so incredibly right. But he was also dead wrong on some really crucial details. It's a powerful reminder that science isn't about finding some ultimate truth. It's a process. It's about constant correction and getting a little less wrong over time. And it kind of makes you wonder, how many of the things we consider scientific facts today are just brilliant, flawed ideas, waiting for the next genius to come along and show us where we went wrong. <laughs>